Thanks for downloading the second episode of No Country for New Nashville's podcast series. This time, host Brad Wilson sits down with JT Daly of Paper Routes, discuss the band's history, albums, current projects, and much more. Okay, the gentleman sitting beside me has been uh, quite busy the last few years here in Nashville via Ohio. In 2012, this frontman, visual artist, and motorcycle enthusiast followed his crushing solo debut, Memory, with an album of pop anthems, speaking of Paper Out's devastating second album, Piece of Wild Things. Two years later, he's not slowing down. Uh, one bit on top of a production and uh, a score for the upcoming short film, Blood and Oil. He's currently recording the third Paper Out album, uh, Beyond Pumped, one of my all-time favorite bands, one of my all-time favorite vocalists. So excited to be hanging out at the home this is the best intro of heard. JT Daily. JT! Thank you. That was... That was I'm very... Yeah. Thank you for that. So we're at your home. Uh, we just you got are. out of the sauna, uh, yes. play, played a little racquetball, because you're a rich rock star. I am. So we're in the hills of uh, Nashville. I don't know if there actually are hills. I'm drowning in success. Yep. We just got done swimming in a pile of cash. Mm -hmm. um, Ducktail style. Absolutely. <laughs> no other way. Yeah. No, have, doing a, a dive into those coins. coins. Gold. Golden coins. Yeah. That I admit that was a little painful, yeah. but uh, you know what? We wiped off with a towel. Uh, now we're just relaxing in uh, his twenty-room mansion. Getting pedicures. Yep, getting pedicures right now. And I can't say uh, I'm just so happy to be here. Well, JT, uh, for those of you who don't know out there, JT and I know each other. Uh, Man, we go way back. How long has it been? At least six, seven years. I believe I was... That seems right. The Stan, first... Is that right? Yeah, Stan, can you confirm? Yeah, it was like 2006. Yeah. Confirmation. Yeah, 2000, yeah, 2006. Confirmation Stan. That's how you got that nickname. <laughs> yeah, he's beautiful. Uh, yeah, so we... I believe I did the first paper out... The first. Either the first paper out interview, maybe the first paper out in studio. You did. Yeah, um, honestly. Some really... This and this is a great follow up from uh, the last podcast where where I was hanging out with Brooke because if there was two bands that defined me um, in my time in Nashville in the music industry, it would undoubtedly be Paper Out and Brooke Wagner. Thank you, man. Um, growing up musically, you're jack of all trades. You're multi instrumentalist, but correct me if I'm wrong drums were actually your first love is that correct first love yeah I, I would say i actually went to school this again plays into my <laughs> so uncool that people think that i'm cool theory i actually went to college on a saxophone scholarship really yes yep um i played the saxophone i shredded the saxophone <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I pretty much quit playing it the second I got to college. Um, but I always loved drums. Drum, like I played saxophone because I was good at it. And my perspective has always been go the path of least resistance. So I thought, well, how am I going to get the scholarship that I need to go to the school that I'm going to go to? Yeah. Well, I'm going to have to drum against all of these people. But who's going to go up and play the saxophone well? <laughs> you know, I mean, granted, there are a lot of great saxophonists, saxophone yeah, players. Yeah. Stan will tell us later. Yeah. Um, yeah, there are a lot of great saxophone players in the world, but I don't 
really think a lot of them were going to be competing to go to the school that I went to. So I busted that out, and it definitely was the path of least resistance in it. So, But I naturally, reached, you had to have been playing the saxophone for years, right? I started playing the saxophone when I was in sixth grade, so I don't really know. It might Actually, it might have even been a little bit younger than that. I started a year before the average... Ohio child starts joining band and stuff. Okay. Just getting a jump on... on, on I don't know why. Well, I think my dad was like, you know, what do you want to play? Like piano, you know, guitar, whatever. My dad was was a guitar teacher, and I would just pick the saxophone. Um, Was there any uh, saxophonist? Sax. Okay. I'm... It doesn't doesn't feel right coming out of... No, and, and me being a... A Someone who, <laughs> who, 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 who received, was a scholarship. Who actually received money from <laughs> an from a university <laughs> to give me uh you know the, Is there a uh, saxophone? Yes, in I'm sorry, I got I got really sidetracked because I was turning around to find it. For, from someone who was given money to play, you think that I would know the term. You would know the term. Yeah. yeah. It's actually uh since then the saxophone has been played on many recordings that I've done. Really? Um, the S- Sally song, The Nightmare Before Christmas okay, yeah. cover that I did. Yeah. All of the horns are me in that, including a sax solo. Oh. <laughs> yes. Um, yes. the Switchfoot remix. Okay. Of the original. I have a sax, kind of a sax solo in it, but I play almost all of the horns in that. And the Paper Out song, Calm My Soul, has probably like six saxophone tracks in it. The whole intro, the boom, yeah. boom, boom, it's just my voice and saxophones. I had no idea that was saxophone. Hey, dude, you're the, looking uh, at it. This is, uh, alert the press, guys. This is a, a hot story that we're uh, yeah. we're breaking. JT uh, Daly, saxophone player extraordinaire. So you're in college. Yeah. You, you pick back up the drums. Yeah. So what what inspires you to trade in the sticks for a mic? Uh, can I assume it's Phil Collins or is it somebody else? <laughs> uh, I actually, I don't really know if I ever, I mean, I was singing before then. I was in high school bands. That was my thing. I just started singing because no one else really wanted to. Um, it, I honestly don't really think it was ever really in my personality to be like a front man. Yeah. You know, um, I just started singing because I had to. And so that probably came first. But again, it was this, um, everyone's going to be singing. So I came, you know, when I came to college and I started drumming, I mean, I was already drumming, but uh, I mean, some of my friends, this guy named Josh Heiner, there was a guy named Luke DeJanes, um, I mean, the, some of the some of the best drummers I've still ever seen in my life were there, and they've gone on to do amazing things. Um, but I decided, well, I'm not going to be the guy that gets the call if I'm up against these guys. So yeah. what can I do now? So then I started doing um, percussion, just really odd percussion, really odd instruments, other ways to get weird sounds. It's probably the first time I ever started experimenting with sampling. Oh, so I was wow. really into Portishead and stuff. Yeah. And then it was probably a year later that I started singing in college and letting people know then. I don't really know if, if I guess, if I answered your question. I guess I always was singing. I just um, I just hit it because I, I thought it would be... Uh, I, I just... N- no artist wants to be given a title or described as like one thing, yeah. you know? And uh, if you have to be described by that one thing, you want to stand out. And I didn't just want to be a singer. Yeah, absolutely. So moving forward, you do you do the band thing in Greenville College for a while. You guys relocate to Nashville. Um, that band dissolves. Correct. You're hanging out with Chad and JT. <laughs> Chad discovers the laps the laptop, starts making beats in his bedroom. Correct. Bottom bunk studios. Is that correct? Still, still <laughs> called that. Okay, good. Good. And uh paper outs form. Two thousand five, you guys put out this EP, uh two thousand five, two thousand six. 
Yeah. World domination quickly awaits. It was all, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Full length absence comes out in 2009. It's uh, you know critically acclaimed. Uh, really does uh, does an excellent job of building your guys' fan base. You guys were allowed to make the record you guys wanted to make. Um, and then things started. You guys went through the whole touring cycle yeah. for the next few years. Uh, and then things uh, got pretty rocky. It's been yeah well documented. Um, in 2000, uh, as you were writing for the second full length, Andy Smith, founding member, uh, decides to bow out. Uh, you're going through a lot personally. You're going through a divorce. Um, and then on top of that, you're dealing with, uh, these issues with your label universal who was putting you guys in limbo. They were wanting singles. Uh, they were wanting four singles, I believe. And, they wanted four, and Absence had none. <laughs> none. Yeah, they uh, they want you f- finish, finish. Yeah. So. Yeah. So uh, so they had four, you know they wanted four. So you guys did, you guys took the challenge. You did you did a few things that you hadn't done previously. Again, all happening in the midst of the most tumultuous time. Uh, you started. You started exploring co-writing for the first time as a band, I believe. Mm. Uh, that was uh, fruitful, yet uh, I believe there was definitely some tensions that happened. I know with Gavin, that that was a harder sort of transition for him. Um, but then, uh, so, so what you guys decide to embrace, rather than to get frustrated and jaded with this whole situation with your label, you decide to embrace it. And to actually see what you can offer to this pop audience, uh, an audience that's used to consuming garbage, you're, you're trying to offer substance. Um, and fully embracing uh, these pop songs, and you respond with four monster anthems, Two Hearts, Better Life, Letting You Let Go, and You and I. I need you to know. Easily four of the best songs uh, the band's ever written. Um, talk, talk, talk about that. You guys were able to, to get out of your deal. You released it independently. It's been it's been a year and a half since it came out. It came out in September of 2012. Was that? There's a few things. Was that successful? Because you guys got air. The album got airplay on XM and various other places. But in terms of breaking yeah. on a on a large scale I, the the songs never really seem to to get the momentum do you, do you feel like looking back at it now because there was a lot of fear of whether how your audience would receive these new songs um the change in direction do you feel like it was a success or do you feel like it failed or do you feel like it never really got a chance to succeed can i say all of those yes <laughs> Um, it was a really complicated time because we, I mean, if I can even back up before I finish that thought, Absolutely. I was so, um, removed from life in so many ways that. I almost didn't feel a lot of it. I almost um, was immune to it. There would be massive business decisions being made, and a lot of those decisions were going to directly 
shape the art that we were going to be a part of. And I don't really know if I was as present as I needed to be. But I knew that I had to... Uh, it was it was an evolve or die yeah. time, you know? And it played into my strengths in the sense of we had a label that was asking us to deliver four singles. Like, that's so absurd. <laughs> And they were, they wanted us to be, uh, I mean, they were legitimately talking like talking about Katy Perry tracks and stuff. Yeah. And they wanted us to be bigger than One Republic. And they, uh, they had the money to do it. And they were m- killing us. <laughs> uh, and my, perspective was you know it it can be a game of chess and I tend to think that there's a way to make pop music as avant-garde as possible and there's some in some ways a way to make decently written granted i mean it depends on your perspective on what constitutes decently <laughs> written but really weird artistic song in a pop music format there yeah. are you can dissect you can deconstruct anything i think that's beautiful and that's one of my favorite things to do um and we've always been a band i mean we we loved melody we love melody and so We felt like a lot of bands in our world were kind of throwing the idea of a great song, just a great chorus and a great verse out the window for just these selfish, um, droning indie albums. Yeah. You know? And maybe it was so backwards and such a challenge that it was perfect. You know, yeah, for for us at the time, and we agreed to it. I mean, we agreed to it on our own terms. I I never want people to think that we were cornered into it and we had to do these co writes and that at, in the end we hated it and we still released it. I mean, we fought tooth and nail to make the decisions that we made. We only agreed to write with few like a couple of people and those people like we essentially treated like band members because we just lost a band member yeah and i am so proud of that album i'm proud of that album because it's it's incredible it really is i mean i know it's not popular to to say that about something that you made yeah but it's because of it's the term isomorphism or something like that. Someone, no idea what that means. Someone can Google it. But it's it's essentially like two people can have the exact same amount of talent and can do the exact same thing, but because of demand and or where one person is and the other person isn't, one will be incredibly successful and the other will be incredibly bankrupt. Yeah. And we just never really got at the right place at the right time. I think that has nothing to do with the quality of that album. And if anything, it was the, it was what I was going through, what we all were going through in our lives to have those types of, have the weight of what was actually going on in those lyrics with that, with those types of melodies and those types of songs like, it's rare and I'm I'm gonna stand by it. And I really think that at some point people are gonna look back at that album. Yeah. And be like, that was like that was pop gold. That was like dream pop gold, you know? Absolutely. And I, I remember the first time I heard songs from the album, I was you know, we were at we were at Joy Mansion and you were playing uh you were playing these songs and this was fresh off of, you know, Andy leaving the band. And when I heard these songs, when I heard Better Life, when I heard you and I, because people can mistake simplicity 
for a lack of substance. But I was hearing lyrics in Better Life like, you gave up and I lost track when you love someone who don't love back. Uh, it doesn't matter who's at fault. Nothing matters now at all. Like, I'm hearing that and it's like a punch in the stomach. I'm hearing songs like, you wanted the best around, so you messed around on the blessed ground we stood. I mean, it literally feels like the air gets sucked out of the room. Like, to be able to, previously with Paper Out Records, you guys have always been honest, but it's always been wrapped in in a more ambiguous way, in a more poetic yeah. way. To going through the most devastating time of your entire life, why then choose to be to like lay yourself bare lyrically? It's it's because of the songwriting. It's and like it. That's what I think, at least. I, I think it's because we were making a dream pop album. It's because, you know, we had a label that wanted us to be the biggest band ever and thought that we were going to be the biggest band ever. And the most, you know, like like I said, it was almost like a game of chess. And the, the thing that felt the most unique to me, the thing that felt the most, um, I, I guess, foreign in the best way possible was to be so honest because we're being stretched a little bit outside of our, you know, guys, let's, let's actually try and write a song under four minutes. This verse, chorus, verse, <laughs> yeah. chorus, bridge, chorus, yeah. you know, and the verse has to be quiet and the chorus has to explode and let's try and make it around this BPM. Let's just try <laughs> it. Let's just see what happens. Let's push ourselves. Yeah. You know? And, um, so it felt like, well, where are we going to take risks? Let's take risks in being so honest that I'm not like you're, I'm not Jared Leto. I'm not like, I don't look like Brad Pitt walking around with a microphone. I've never been the guy that like takes off my shirt and does one handed push ups on stage. Yeah. And girls, you know, like throw their bracelets at me. I'm, <laughs> yeah. I'm just me. Yeah. Uh, and I had to be the m most transparent that I've ever been so that people were like, okay, I didn't expect this type of song, but oh my gosh, that's so real. Yeah. You know, but, and I will say that I do have regrets. I mean, we, it, in, man, I said that I have no regrets earlier, but <laughs> I, what, what I mean by that is that there's always something that you want to make a little bit better. Yeah. So maybe regret is the wrong word. I mean, there, I would always love to, to have pushed that album a little bit more. Yeah. You know, I think that we would have loved to have done or loved to have done that, but that album is what it is. I'm so proud of it and we aren't going to do it again. You know, I don't think we're going to make another absence. Yeah. Hopefully we're going to do something better than both of those albums. Yeah. Cuz in the in the age that we're in now, it's it's I look at a band like Fun who uh they exploded, and the single reason why they exploded was because of a Super Bowl commercial and Glee. How nuts is that? Yep. Seriously. And there's no distinction. There's nothing greater about what they were doing compared to what you guys were doing. Uh, how does – is it? do you feel – is there any bitterness, the, the sense that, man, if you guys just got the right exposure, if 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 – if somebody heard those songs then then they would break, you know, like, or is it just, um, do you just kind of look back and, you know, just try not to dwell on it too much? I, I would say it's that Yeah, we try not. Yeah. I mean, in my youth, <laughs> it dissolved my soul. It would keep me up at night. Yeah. Um, because of not because of ego but because of opportunity i think that there are so many things that i would like to do um there's so many things that we have wanted to do you know i mean we are such our biggest strength and our biggest weakness is we're just a bombastic band like we're we're big dreamers and we have a lot of ideas we're an idea band you yeah. know chad and i are both producers and um it's unfortunate that we're still doing like the club circuit yeah and we're still like 
we can't really do any of the production ideas that we had like a decade ago. And we've seen a lot of other bands that honestly, I and I mean, maybe I'm getting more comfortable saying things like this as I, as I age, but I don't mourn it as much. Yeah. But honestly, we're twice as good as those bands. Yeah. I don't think they're that good. Yeah. And... And if they are excellent, I just don't believe them. I mean, that's my, again, yeah. this is just my opinion, but. Um, if you're honest, do you feel like you guys have been mismanaged? Um, in the beginning, yeah. I mean, like when it like really mattered, when everyone thought that we were going to be this big, sexy band. Yeah, absolutely. And we fired them. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. 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 Um, but uh, now our. Um, the only reason why we're still a band is because of our management. Yeah. We, uh, I love our management so much. It's ridiculous. Now, so you've got this album, Piece of Wild Things. And so you're going through this, label issues, um, band members leaving prior to recording. You're going through this, you're going through this divorce. But with, with Andy leaving, uh, I don't think that can be under, you know, like under or overstated. Really, the importance or uh, what that meant, uh, because reaching back to pre paper out, um, you shared lead vocals with him for over twelve years. Forever. I mean, your your entire, you know, essentially your entire uh, musical career. Um, now, all of a sudden, you're tasked with having to be the front man performing performing these extremely personal songs and you no longer have someone else to lean on i mean you had to have felt incredibly exposed was that was that a tough transition yeah um but i am so thankful for it it's i mean when when that first happened i thought that was like our only th i mean i thought that was like the thing that was going to end us. Yeah. Because we had always tried to pride ourselves on writing songs that only we could do with two vocalists. I remember reading when I was a kid an interview on Soundgarden and Kim Thale was talking about how, uh, you know, they tried to write songs where they would use Chris's voice as a, uh, Chris Cornell's voice for all of you teenagers listening. <laughs> <laughs> One of the greatest vocalists of all time. Yeah. Um, Chris Cornell's voice is an instrument, you know, so he would do these really high parts that was almost like a moog or, you know, like a uh, bending, like a uh, shoegaze guitar part and then drop an octave and sing a verse and then skip an octave and go, you know, into this rich, like incredibly... Uh, uh, just over the top chorus and no band could really do that unless you had that type of a singer and there's only one Chris Cornell totally and we tried to have songs where there were counter melodies and things going on to where if someone picked up a guitar and tried to do it they'd be like well can't do that that's a paper out song yeah and we had to abandon that and I hadn't been pushed vocally in a while I'm so thankful now because it's uh I feel like it's something that people uh, talk about is my voice being up front and center now. Yeah. Um, live, I just started feeling more comfortable like doing my thing. You know, I I'm bo I was born six years too late. <laughs> if I was born six years earlier, <laughs> I just I would have eaten a hole through this stuff. Yeah. Um. It's a really odd time to be a weird front man, but yeah. it's all that I do, and I'm not going to change for anyone. I'm sorry. Yeah. You know, I'll play the game to a certain extent. You heard the piece of wild things. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. You know, I'll yeah. give it my all. Yeah. I'll dress up. Yeah. I'll take care of myself. Yeah. Um, but what I do that's, that I think people actually appreciate. I, I, it's just one thing, you know. Yeah. It's only one thing. Yeah. Well, I wanna, I wanna back up just a second because I do want to talk about memory, which while you're going through uh, this 
painstaking process of recording piece of wild things uh the weight's getting heavier of everything you have going on and as a just as a means to cope with everything you had recorded uh the solo album memory which it, it essentially plays out almost like a double album whereas memory is, is is like the initial shock and mourning of your divorce and piece of wild things is more the devastation fallout and ultimately the hope around the corner not quite there yet but you see it coming i would agree yeah um so with memory at, the band was totally cool with you releasing it. it came out in i believe it was was it june of 2012 um honestly man i have no idea <laughs> well yeah. let's let's say june yeah uh the june only, sounds good the only promotion you did for it was an in-store grimies i did yeah and i announced it on twitter uh, yes and uh it was killer and uh but to me that that was one of my favorite I was really torn between my favorite albums of that year, between that and Peace of Wild Things, because it was so exciting for me to really hear the rock elements back in the music, Thank you, the, man. which was what I had fallen in yeah. love with with the, your previous band for all the Drifters. Was this idea of of just these great songs that weren't afraid to show that you were influenced by Chris Cornell, you know, like uh, and and uh, it. While also kind of harking back to the the first paper out EP, you know these these soul crushing songs like no other. Nothing is the same. Time will just erase. The best and the worst of both. Of You played every instrument on the album. The story is that you you borrowed guitars. You played on a broken drum set. I remember talking to Chad uh, when he, when you were recording "Piece of Wild Things." He, he said he said uh, he said that you were in the studio one day recording a guitar, and I was like, "Guitar?" I was like, "I had no idea JT even played guitar." He's like, "Neither did I." <laughs> so, but but here you played the entire you know you played everything on the album, produced and mixed it. Um, nothing. You know, it seems like nothing is ever going to be made of that album again. As far as personally, you've not talked about it since you released it. You did the mi most minimal press you could do. But talk about how what that album did for you personally in that stage of your life. It uh, recording it got my confidence and my sense of wonder back because there was something. There's something so much. There, how can I word this? I'm sorry. Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll just I'll say that there's something so inspiring about uh, having to play every instrument. Yeah, um, I would never. That's not my perspective on life right now to just do that. <laughs> but um, it's amazing. It kind of reminded me of growing up, which is why every song basically takes place in Ohio in my mind. Yeah. And it reminded me of growing up where you just picked up a guitar and, you, you know, you played like two notes with overdrive and you, and you were just shocked that you could get it to sound like that. You know, the first time you learned how to play like the easiest song on any of those instruments and you couldn't believe that your body and this instrument were making, uh, uh, were making music. And you could sing to it. You could turn it into a song. Yeah. And it kind of just made me uh, believe in me. Sounds ridiculous, but it, it did. Yeah. And because I was doing it for myself. And I, I think in my mind I was excited to share it with like four people. <laughs> And then, like, typical me, I mean, I made an album cover for it. I did everything. Yeah. Like, I'm going to town on this. I got a guest vocalist to sing on it, you know? Um, and turned it in. And it wasn't until we realized there was going to be so much drama with the piece of Wild Things. And I felt like my life was just on pause. And that, like, no one really was going to know that as far as my art was concerned, 
people were going to find out like these things that I'd gone through like years later. And that, yeah. that bothered me and I didn't want to have to deal with that. I wanted it to be like, no, I'm moving on. You yeah. know, this, this, this is here. And I just don't think it's healthy for any artist to like, just have these stillborn moments. Yeah. I think you create them, you give birth, you show them to the world, you move on. And, um, it was Chad's idea and I'm so, so incredibly grateful that Chad and Gavin uh, supported uh, me in that. Because I'm sure it's not awesome. Yeah. You know? Yeah. <laughs> um, and that was that. Um, it's a special album. One of my favorite songs I've ever been a part of is on that album. No other. Yeah. Um, yeah. And, and that was the that was definitely like one of the chi- like the chills moment for me was the. You know that song. You know when the previous one, uh, "You Go Your Way" and "I Go Mine." Like mm-hmm. those those two songs. You know, like those are to hear something honest, to to be able to hear something real. Um, I think that's the ultimate goal, and I think you don't. That doesn't happen. You don't hear authenticity. You don't hear the my favorite songs are the ones where you can actually you can hear a song and you can feel that person's heartbreaking. Like I can feel the devastation of what you're going through at the time, and to be able, and the only way that you can do that is to be willing to um, let that be seen while you're at rock bottom. Yeah. Um. So going through that, that whole process, um, in that tr- in that time of your life, you know, the theme that's always been. And we'll get a little lighthearted after this. I know this has been pretty heavy, but this is a this is a heavy band, and these are these were heavy al- albums. But the band has, as long said, the common theme that runs through nearly every paper out song is the idea of love and God. Did your divorce shake your faith in either of those? Uh, absolutely. Yeah. It um. It changed my perspective on them completely. Yeah. For for a while. But I think that as with any sort of trauma, you acknowledge it and you you move forward. You know, I mean I had to it wasn't really something that I felt comfortable uh not facing does that make sense yeah absolutely um i feel like i feel like this is such a hard thing i'm i'm trying to keep in mind that if people are listening to this like they can't like see my face because i feel like that's half the communication on (laughs) on, on heavy topics yeah absolutely but it's um i think i abandoned all ritual for a while and it was interesting that i found myself slowly bringing them back into my life without knowing it for instance Mm -hmm. um i grew up in the church and i would go to church and then i quit going to church but then i would go somewhere to like kind of read and be by myself and then i would go back there on the same day and then i would go back there every week on the same (laughs) day and it was like (laughs) i i slowly brought all these things back in to my life you know yeah um and it was interesting to see that i wasn't doing it because um wasn't i I was doing it because i wanted to it was it was just interesting i don't know i'm still you know figuring all of that out i think that's the point though um but I mean that's that's the that's the foundation to life. I mean you can break everything down to loving God. That's a whole other topic though. Yeah. Uh joined by JT Daly from the band Paper Out. They're recording their third album as we speak. Uh we're go- we're going to talk in just a moment about this cover series that uh they've been working on. We featured on no, uh, the No Country site as well as um some film scoring that he's been doing, but, uh, yeah, but I'm totally, totally with you. That's, it is, it is tough being able to communicate without, the, you know, um, 
you without the nonverbal, you know, communication, people can't really yeah. see. Uh, it's it, these are just heavy, heavy moments. I mean, this is real life, you know. And um, but that that kind of brings me to to this this next idea is I want to talk favorite albums, and Bring it. I want to talk since we've already established you're not cool. <laughs> uh, we've already established no. that's out of the way, so we can take cred out of the equation. Yeah, um, indie, whatever. At the end of the at the end of the day, what are five albums that will always get you through? If you're not cool, if you're not, if people aren't looking at JT Daily, Paper Out, whatever, five albums that will get me through. Yeah. Maybe this is a desert island list, but maybe it's not. All right. Here's what I'd say. I mean, I'm going to have to go with my favorite album of all time, which, I mean, I guess maybe it's so typical now that it won't seem cool, but I swear, I'm, I'm being honest. <laughs> yeah, totally, totally. Radiohead Kid A. Kid A is my go-to. Me Without You, Catch For Us, The Foxes. Mm. Yeah, I'll say Color Revolt, Plunder, Beg, and Curse. Mm. Um, okay, I got. I have two more. While you're thinking, I'll, I'll relay the story because I, I believe that you love Kid A, and I know that's not cool because I remember very distinctly being at Grantland, which is where... True story. Um where a lot of absence was recorded and we were, you, you, Chad and I were hanging out and I think we just watched uh, one of those classic albums things and it might've been on Joshua tree. I'm not sure. It might've been something else, but, yeah, I don't uh, remember. but I, I had mentioned that, um, that I, I didn't know what I thought about Radiohead, that I wasn't sure if I got it, if I understood it, if, um, you know, because my foundation musically has always been on hooks. You know, if I'm honest, if I'm not afraid of being cool, my foundation musically comes from 80s power ballads on MTV. Love it. It comes from Living on a Prayer. It comes from all these anthems because I'm part of the MTV generation. You know, growing up, watching these songs. Uh, and as a result, it developed this love for massive choruses, for songs that you could sing at the top of your lungs and and gravitate towards and claim as your own. Um, and Radiohead obviously ne is, does not often fall in that category. Uh, so I remember saying that to to JT, and he said, "Okay, let's let's change that." So we went we went we went upstairs to his room, and he put on Kid A, "How to Disappear Completely." It's, it's Tied for my favorite song of all time. And dropped the needle on it. And I just sat on his floor and listened, like in silence, for four minutes, five minutes, however, however long the song is. And it was one of those, this is why I love music moments. Like to be able to, you know, heck, the name of my radio show in college was your favorite mixtape, to expose people to. Uh, the music that I loved. And then here, the, this guy was a friend, also one of my all-time favorite vocalists, is doing the same to me. Like, we're having that moment. He's sharing that moment with me. And it, it was, yeah, it was heavy. It was powerful. Like, and that was, and it definitely changed the way that I thought about Radiohead, you know, from that from that point forward. Yeah, that is the most uh, cerebral, cerebral and also... Um just soul crushing album <laughs> like the those two things rarely uh can coexist yeah and i believe that 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 album is that for me so i would pick i would pick that that album for that reason and it's just my favorite album yeah i would pick um got me without you me without you because yeah. the wonder of aaron's lyrics the way that he looks at love and god yeah. i love Color Revolt is just probably my favorite band, and I want that. And then I would probably pick, uh, you know, I mean, since since I've only got five and I'm can only listen to them, uh, probably Super Unknown Soundgarden. 
Yes. Because Chris Cornell rules. (laughs) And I know every single drum fill on that album. It's kind of ridiculous. When I put it in, I, I won't listen to it for like a year or something. I'll put it in. I can do every drum fill. There are songs that when they finish, I know the amount of space in between the songs. Wow. So like, bow. Dun, 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 dun. Like, I know when they come in. Yes. And then, I mean, since you're here, yeah. I might have to go. I might have to go Third Eye Blind so I get the trifecta. Thank you. Because the trifecta is is a term that we have made where we talk about how every <laughs> classic album needs to have the last three tracks. Yep need to be the trifecta where you open up with the singles and then, you know, you throw in some deep cuts, but then the last three songs basically need to take you on this emotional and musical roller coaster and be so far outside of what you even felt like you could accomplish as a band. They need to be the songs where you're like, oh my gosh. Yeah. Yeah. So if you're listening to this, your instinct when he said Third Eye Blind was to say, oh, Third Eye Blind sucks. Now hold that. Like resist. I think that's Re- changing, though, to be completely yeah. honest. People have realized. I, it is changing, but it, it's it's not. I, I, will, I will say this. I, I, Gr- Grimey's is my favorite record store in the world. Yes. I love every single person who works there. Uh, they, I could not be a bigger supporter of them. So, a supporter so much, in fact, that that I spent some time um, that they allowed me to to hang out there on the weekends and to uh, earn some money to support my record buying. I had such a huge support system in place for my love for Third Eye Blind self titled that I played that album in store. Now. I can't say that it went as well as I expected because not a lot of people are are ready for that album in certain circles. That is true. Uh, But I will say this, that it is changing. But if you hear this and you're like, oh, Third Eye Blind, whatever, it's a band that plays Jumper, like, listen to this trifecta of background. Background, dude. Background when the guitars come in. Yeah. Motorcycle Drive by God of Wine. I mean, the whole album is a greatest hits package, but the best songs, the final three, are Trifecta. so moody. Yeah, it's it sounds like a completely different band yep. in a good way. Absolutely, I think a band should be able to do yep. that. Um, and then when you go back and then you hear the singles, you're like, oh my gosh, I love the singles now. Yep, because of the trifecta. Yep, you realize like this is like just how bands used to be yeah uh, and the fact and yeah. the only thing tragic about that whole album is that it's the most amazing album and it was made by one of the all-time scumbags uh steven jenkins <laughs> so, he, i'm sorry <laughs> i'm sorry steven but i'm not not really a fan of you <laughs> oh man but the guitar playing of kevin cadigan it's uh, incredible that's yeah. eric valentine's production that snare drum is is honestly legendary. You, do, do you know the? Do you know how that snare drum? How long it lasted? It lasted all the way up until the Queens in the Stone Age album that Dave Grohl drummed on, "Songs for the Deaf." Ah, uh, yeah, and I bet it all the way, <laughs> all the way, and Dave Grohl broke it. He broke the drum head. That drum head had never been changed, really, up until that, up until that recording. That's what the legend is. Yeah, and that he broke it on recording "Songs for the Deaf." Well, considering how hard Dave hits, yeah. that does not surprise me. But do, yeah, so, Third Eye Blind self-titled, um, I mean, it literally is uh, a, a perfect album. And But that brings me up to one thought. is Because I was thinking this, and I wasn't sure if I could ask this, but I love that you said this about being, you could sound completely different and be okay. Like, do you think you could make a Paper Out album and not sound like Paper Out? Like, do, meaning... Do you, do you have to have electronic elements to be a paper album? Oh, no, not at all. No, I mean, we, I mean, just wait till we end and yeah. we release all the B sides we have. Yeah. I mean, we have a lot of songs. We write a lot of songs. Um, but yeah, I mean, abs- absolutely. I mean, we're very uh, particular about the songs that we let uh, be released. 
And they're because we feel like, you know, that palette was appropriate at that time. But um, I think that I think that Gavin's drumming is such a particular thing. You know, he's he he just does this. You, he does him. You know, I I I think that people reference him. People try and drum like him. People, you know, describe oh. beats as a Gavin type thing. You know, he's a beast. Chad's production, Chad's songwriting, Chad's Chad's drumming is is its own thing. You know, and I. But I think that Chad can execute that even on a piano. I mean, Chad, just the way that he plays sometimes is, I can, I just hear a part and I know that that's something that he wrote. Or yeah. he can just do, you know. It's, you can't really find words to describe it. And obviously, I mean, I'm talking about these people like they're legends. They are to me. You know, I'm I'm so proud to, to work with, with these guys. Um I think at some point people will probably realize that. Yeah. Um, but no, I mean, we don't need samples. I think that that's a, that is a color we love to paint with because it sets us apart. And we're probably going to use a lot of that on the new album with the old guitar type stuff, you know? Um, yeah, I guess that answers your question. It does. I'm joined by JT Daly, a paper out a frontman, a vocalist extraordinaire. Uh, paper out's currently recording their third album. Um, we're going to touch on covers, uh, a cover series that they've been working on. But first, I want to ask a more serious question: Is how much of your success do you do, do you attribute to Bo Jackson? This, yeah, you can take thirty-five percent. <laughs> I mean, let's let's be but let's be honest though. Bo Jackson, you're a huge Bo Jackson fan. Hopefully, Love Bo. hopefully a lot of people know that about you. Um, it's uh, you know, two sports superstar. Um, I mean, his I think his influence on humanity. I cannot. Have you seen his thirty on thirty? Uh, Absolutely. Did you cry? Because I cried. Uh, I, I cried. I, I think I probably have to break it down towards the moments I wasn't crying. I think yeah. that's that's the only way that I can really sort through it. Uh, and the fact that the guy is a uh, an archer. The guy is a uh, he's guy, a he's a he's a Greek god. That's a that's a perfect way to describe him. The, the guy can pull out a bow and arrow. He can. Had a home run to the moon. Yeah. Uh, uh, there's nobody like Bo. These no. Days. When I used to get um, a little anxious, I'm 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 cut from the uh, the anxious cloth, if okay. you will. When I would become riddled with anxiety before a show, or you know, before something was going to happen, I would pull up this website called YouTube.com. Okay, I think I've heard of it. Is it and a new upstart? I, it's a new thing. It's everywhere. You can just Google it. Okay. And I searched this thing called Bows on Parade. <laughs> Have I told you about this? I, I don't, uh, I'm not sure, but it sounds amazing. <laughs> it's a Bo Jackson highlight reel set to Rage Against the Machines, Bowls on Parade, <laughs> called Bows on Parade. And I'm pretty sure that you're going to watch it every day from now on. Even just hearing the name Bows on Parade, I, like right now, I just want to slam dance and smash everything in this room. Yeah, don't because we're in a studio. Okay, yeah. all right, <laughs> fair enough. All right, I'll I'll hold it in. Um, yeah, so I'm gonna look that up immediately, and I feel like I've seen it, and maybe the fact that I haven't been watching it daily is why there seems like there's a void in my life right now. Yeah, Bows on Parade. Um, so the band is currently doing. Uh, I want to talk to you about the full length, the third the third album you're working on, but I want to talk about two things quickly. Um, this cover series you're doing. Mm -hmm. In October, you surprised the world by uh, releasing a cover of Lordy's Royals, which um, uh, people were completely amped about. Uh, you guys got an 
huge response. It was the first time he ever um, performed a cover live, I believe. Um, you follow that up with a total, I don't know if it's a 180, but Thanksgiving Day, you you served up a plate of Destiny's Child. Give thanks. Give thanks with Say My Name. Yeah. What... Like t- what? What is this? Like what? What? In- what inspired you guys to? Do- was this just as a way to um, kind of stay active? You know, in this downtime. What? Why? Why do a whole series of covers? Um, kind of the same thing that the covers are doing was what doing the solo album was for me. Really, it kind of just got us our recording chops back, and we kind of took pride in the fact that we were just not a band that did covers ever. The only cover we have ever done before Lord's cover was uh, two Lou Reed songs. One, Metal Machine Music, in front of Lou Reed. I remember at South By, right? Yeah, at the Lou Reed tribute show. So, I mean, we, we aren't really a band that does covers. And so... It kind of just seems like another challenge for us. Like, well, let's just do this. I don't really know if there's a ton of thought put into it. It was, it just seemed, seemed fun. It seemed like something that would uh, keep our minds moving. So we made a list of a ton of songs. A lot of them we've started and hadn't finished. And some of them went better than the others. We knew we wanted to do Lords immediately because we had loved that song for a while, and it was crazy that when we released it, it basically had just blown up in the yeah. states. Then we uh, won the Ryan Seacrest thing, which was awesome. <laughs> yeah, I remember that. <laughs> Say my name got released just because it was such a. Uh, it was just a curveball. I mean, it's just this female pop group. Whose idea was that? That had to have been Chad's, right? <laughs> It was mine. Whoa. <laughs> oh I mean, gosh. you should see the songs that we've started. I mean, there have been some. Can can, can you let me know a few of them that aren't going to make the cut? That, that aren't going to make the cut. Um, A Roy Orbison tune. Which Gavin has strong. Yeah. Uh, Orbison family. She's a mystery girl. That song. <laughs> yes. She's a mystery girl. Uh, I want to talk about um, Blood and Oil, the short film. Have you you you, you provided original music? Um, a piece a piece called "The Blackest Bird" for the yeah. short film Blood and Oil. Had you ever uh, scored film before? I had done one thing for the Smart Mark Boys, and um, that whole project got put on hold. But as a whole, this has always been kind of my dream. Yeah. To eventually move more into like a Nick Cave sort of uh, path in life. Yeah. You know? <clears throat> and I've wanted to take on more and more of these jobs. This is just one of the first ones that I've actually done that's seen the light. Wow. And it was with a group of players that I've been wanting to record. Is there, uh, will, will the music be released officially? It will be, and I'm so pumped about this probably by the time this comes out yeah. i have no idea i don't know if you're chopping this up and releasing stuff yeah i don't know we'll see we yeah chop it up you know? uh it february 11th which is gonna come up like in a little more than a week i'll be releasing it it'll be my first piece ever released in the classical genre wow. and i am so thrilled i'm so proud of this piece the players that played on it are amazing it was tracked live um I conducted it. It was like a dream. Yeah. And um, I can't wait to do more of this. I know that people don't really buy music, and I know that people don't really buy instrumental music, but I feel like this 
this genre and this type of stuff is is uh it needs to exist and i really yeah. i really hope that people pick it up absolutely or listen what you know speaking of films do you have any off the top of your head? You know, do you have any favorite scores? You know that absolutely. Birth, Alexander Desplat, Alexander Desplat, and everything is mm-hmm. remarkable. Clint Mansell, The Fountain. Yeah. Um. I mean, Alexander Desplat did the Twilight piano thing. Like they bring him in to like do that, and it's perfect. Yeah. It's just perfect, and I love that. They, you know, they're like, what, what can we do to get us cred? <laughs> you know, they bring him in and he's like, oh, you mean this schwabity do plays it on the piano. And they're like, what? It's so yeah. good. Um, uh, Max Richter, man. I mean, he's, yeah, he's just ridiculous. I mean, I could talk for way too long Yeah, uh, about this world. There's something about. Because in Paper Out, one of my main jobs is lyrics and words. There's something about sculpting feelings and believability without using those things that I find so intriguing. And I'm going to sing on some Blood Orchestra stuff. And oh, really? I'm going to be releasing um, many more Blood Orchestra pieces. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah, so I'm excited about it. This is the beginning of many. Paul Thomas Anderson's your favorite director. Is Obsessed right? with him, yeah. What um, what it, what is it about his f- films that you gravitate towards? And and you know, with Philip Seymour Hoffman passing away, because I know it's generic and it's so uh, unbelievably tragic. Uh, because for me, I'm one of those guys that uh, I, I watch the director's cut of Almost Famous, and I r- instantly like believe in music again you know i instantly um know why i've committed the rest of my life to to music totally. you know, something like that and and with philip uh hoffman's his performance as lester bangs is so iconic yeah you know i have a lester bangs uh book in my in my car right now you know wow. like yeah uh, and but i know one of the band's favorites and they tweeted about this was um, his performance in Magnolia and that yeah. film having a huge influence on the band. What what is it about uh, uh, Anderson that that makes you obsessed? Yeah. Well, I should probably also go on the record. I'm probably the one that's the most just head over heels over P.T. Anderson and Magnolia, you know. Chad is definitely the Cameron Crow. Oh yeah, you know. Oh yeah, he Gav, is. <laughs> Gav's probably right in between. Yeah, that's you know. Yeah, totally. Um, there's something about P.T. Anderson with how dark he gets. I love dark art. I it's I don't know what it is. It makes me feel. I prefer dark things, but there's something about the way that he tells redemption that I find so beautiful and so real the his storytelling and his writing you know there are lines in magnolia where the old man is like life isn't short it's long it's long hmm. like that i just i don't know what it is that he's just the way he finds beauty in the darkest moments and how brave he has been with his writing and the characters that he's um, brought into the world. I just, I love him. And I mean, there's a reason why Johnny Greenwood is scoring his films, you know? And there's a reason why I will never get a call to score his films (laughs) because of Johnny Greenwood. But I mean, that is like, that's where I want to head. I want to create, um, the sonic landscape behind those stories. That's yeah. that's a dream of mine. And that, that kind of leads me into the to this next idea of production. Within the last few years, you've been taking on more of a production role, working with different artists. And um, even last year, um, uh, you worked with uh, on, on a, an album by Daniel uh, Basha. Yeah. And uh, 
a second album. You did a, an album called Cur- Is It Currents with Sarah McIntosh. I did. I did. Um, geez, I'm trying to think. It was probably a year before that okay. that I did Current, and then I did Curtains with Harvest. Okay. Yeah. Okay, and now you're doing uh, a new EP with Sarah a called Thousand Champions. Thousand Champions. Yeah. What? Um, t- talk about that for a few seconds. You know what? Um, putting on those pants, uh, offering your voice to these other projects. What? Um, what? A, what kind of experience has that been like? Well, first of all, I think the reason why. I decided to work with those people. So I felt like they were, they kind of just, they stuck out like, you know, a sore thumb in the worlds that they were in. Um, and I, I kind of love that. I, I've, I've always kind of loved working with like the misfits, you know, yeah. I'm the producer on the Island of misfit toys <laughs> and I'm in Nashville. So, I mean, I'm going to get a lot of those types of religious artists yeah. and if they stick out, I'm going to say yes. You know, if I live somewhere else, I would take on probably a different genre of, of the, the misfits. I, j- there's something that I just love about it. There's something yeah. it's the, it's the challenge. We get along, you know, I'm, I'm with them, you know, we're cut from the same cloth and, uh, Bashta is insane. And I think he wouldn't, I, I, I say that as a compliment and he, he would be proud if I knew that I said that about him. Yeah. He is a, he has a restless mind. He's out there, man. And I loved working with him because he let me do whatever I wanted, honestly. And Sarah, I loved her when I was a kid. I heard her band Chasing Furies. Hmm. I loved her voice. I thought she had one of the best voices I'd ever heard in my life. Yeah. And I've just loved working with her because as a vocalist, it's so incredible to work with someone who can do anything you ask them to. Yeah. She can do anything. And A Thousand Champions started because... She, um, we've just had so many conversations about family and adoption and, and I mean, it's a whole other conversation. It's so layered and she wanted to, um, you know, try to try putting on a mask like we were talking about earlier, you know, and call it a thousand champions and it will kind of ease her mind into, uh, trying different things and, I said, sure, you know, I'll, I'll sing on it some, even if that's what you want. Yeah. I'm, I believe so much in her craft and in her voice and we're going to make an EP. I mean, it's technically already made. It's just being mixed now. Okay. Yeah. Now you said something that I feel like is really important. There's a, like a press kit for Daniel's album and you were talking about, uh, the impact that he was having on you, what drew you to him, um, and how authentic he was, how these songs sort of made you believe in those songs again, you know, like, uh, but you, you said something that was really, um, that was really telling. And it was that idea that, um, as far as that genre goes, you said, I believe, I believe in a God right now. I do not think I believe in Christian music. I don't understand it. I don't know why it exists. I don't I don't know what it even is. And you've long held these issues um, with the label and business commodity of Christian music. However, it, it, it seems like um, something keeps drawing you back to it. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can't you can't run from it completely. Yeah. You can't you can't escape it. Um, and if we're talking true authentic songs of worship without labels, without boundaries, uh, I mean the, the tracks that close out absence and peace of all things dance on our graves and calm, calm my soul. I mean, that's about as close as you can get to that. Um, at least in, in my opinion. Um, and 
and they also happen to be the ones that your fans tend to cling to the most. And that's not coincidental. Yeah. Why, why do you think in the age where any mention of God completely writes you off as a human being or anything music related? Why do you think in that age um, that's, that your fans are really connecting to that? And, I mean, do you ever have a desire to write a full album of spirituals? Oh, uh, man, there's a lot in there. Uh, I don't, I mean, I can't really answer if, if I ever desire to do that because I I don't know. You know, I can't, yeah. can't really predict where my head is going to be at. I'm kind of just doing what is coming naturally. And in the sense of I'm not forcing those songs to come out. They were Mm. just there, you know? And I think that's why I don't understand why there's an industry that's just completely based on those things because there are, there are other ways to talk about a God. Yeah. There are other ways to talk about an eternal perspective. There are other ways to love and forgive and, there are other things happening and I don't think that that world allows those topics to be brought to light. And to be completely honest, I mean, and we all know it, a a lot of that music just sucks and (laughs) it's, it's embarrassing. Isn't it tragic? Yeah. And I mean, I don't, yeah, I don't want to say like much more than that because I don't really even want it to be a topic that much with yeah. with with my life. I know that it will be because people are just pumped to yeah. to you know to unpack whatever it is. I mean, I am I'm comfortable writing the songs that I'm writing that talk about God because I believe them. I'm not really going to do anything past that though. Yeah. You know? Yeah. Um, maybe I'm going to be in a spot someday where I am writing a lot more of those types of songs, you know, but I really just don't think that that, I guess that church ish audience is, would really even like a lot of the things that I would have to say if I was forced to write a song all about God, I'm pretty sure they would be really disappointed. Yeah. And it's interesting that the artists that I love the most, the you know, the Nick Caves, the Mark Lanigans, the Me Without Yous, the Color Revolts, um, those artists all sing about God a lot, and I just like that type of music. I like community music. I love the I love the aspect of the gospel in music. I love gospel like choir music. I love it's like rock and roll to me. Yeah. It's amazing. It's punk. You know, I, I love how, I mean, that's about as, I mean, that's, it's, it's not cool and it's, it's, it should be just tearing walls down. It should be anti the man, yeah. you know, and I, I love it. Yeah. And I hope that I get more there as, as I become the artist that I'm trying to become, you know. Um, but, you know, I, I love that the paper out fans, you know, are united with those songs. I think it's a brave thing to admit that you like those songs. Um, yeah. I mean, call my, uh, dance on our graves is brutal. I mean, that chorus, you know, I remember even specifically last show you guys played the exit in. I came up to you and just said, man, I needed that tonight. Like, I needed to to sing out, I need you now, I need you more than ever before. Yeah. And and you just nailed it on the head be, because it's coming naturally. Because you, cause I, I know when I hear that song, you believe it when you sing yeah. it. And that's the distinction. You can't force that and you can't try to replicate that. Do you feel? Do you feel like it's going to be a trend to? Is every paper out album like going to be going to close out with one of those sort of anthems, or is it just coincidental that that's happened for the first two? No, I mean, 
I can't again. I can't really predict anything. I wouldn't be surprised. I mean, it's it's kind of it's kind of just who we are. But I also, I mean, anything can happen with with paper out. So I'm joined by JT uh, for the No Country podcast. We are talking about his love for film, uh, the score that he just completed um, with the Blood Orchestra for a short film, um, Blood and Oil. Uh, the score is ho- well. Hopefully, already have been released. It's being released February tenth, eleventh, February eleventh. So you if or tenth list- to you? Okay, tenth yeah. to me. Yeah. So, um, and we're talking about the third album that you guys are recording. Correct. So, right now, um, there's a few questions I want to ask about that. Um, you guys are independent now. No pressures from anybody to write any sort of songs, the singles that we talked about. But, and I know you said earlier that, um, you wouldn't repeat what happened on piece of wild things just as, um, likely as you were to repeat something on absence. But this idea, like what's driving these songs this time around? Are you, are you, is it, is an extension of what was happening on wild things? Are you completely turning your back on the, the, the massive pop elements? What's, what's, like what's making you come alive through this process with this album? When we started, we talked about this idea of just being completely fearless in, in the recording process. Cause the reality is, is we don't have anything to lose. We've been a, we've been a band for too long. We've, there's no reason why we should even be alive as a band. <laughs> We've endured pretty much everything that a band can endure. Yeah. Besides, you know, like, the typical we've got a member in drug rehab or something but we've we've done it it all and i think uh we just it's it's a freeing start it's uh, i don't know if we've ever really had this except for when we first began as a band where we th- there's no i don't really know if there's that much pressure yeah the pressure is all you know created by ourselves all the deadlines are ourselves but you guys did a ba- you guys did a band camp to kind of we did yeah. to, to launch the sort of writing uh for the record that it, that was a really cool idea uh kind of go into a little detail on, on what that was yeah, I mean, we, we're going to keep some of this between our, be, you know, as a band secret, but we basically had three hard drives running the entire time and brought in a different artist each day, a wow. guest artist, yeah. and did a series of writing exercise and exercises and documented the entire process. And the goal was to get song starts or sample ourselves for the beginning of this album essentially create our own a paper out library and that's what we're using right now and it's taking a while to go through and kind of pick you know what we're going to be using but i think as a whole i challenge the guys to consider you know what if we're the best band in the world honestly what if we are yeah and what if we just haven't been given the same opportunity that a lot of other bands have been given? What if we're just having to do this, you know, paying ourselves what we're paying ourselves, which is probably below poverty, <laughs> recording in our own studio that we've used our entire, you know, record advance to buy, which is why we still are below poverty. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, we're so yeah. thankful, don't get me yeah. wrong, but... And just doing everything ourselves still. But what if we're the best? Does that free your mind at all? Does that make you think, okay, you know what? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to write this type of a song today. Because what if I set every trend? What if, uh, what if it's okay to write a massive chorus right now? And I was just curious what that would do to our, our headspace. And so far, I feel like that's been kind of the the theme, you know, like, just be fearless. Just go in and go for it. Don't look back. Yeah. 
what as far as lyrically um you know the piece of wild things in memory had some very specific themes you know especially what you were going through personally uh you know things have changed since then you know you're now engaged um, this is true to a to a lovely lady who's in a, a fantastic band of her own Saint this John's. is true uh what's what are you living through right now what like what are you trying to say through these new songs yeah. that I mean, we've just begun, you know, so I don't, I don't want to speak too much into it. But I think something that keeps coming up is that, um, in, in the songs, is that it's, it's easy to, it's easy to love people from afar. It's hard to love them intimately when they're up close because you are forced to deal with your own trauma and you're forced to deal with your own demons. Yeah, wow. And uh, I think that it's a very revealing thing. I think the closer someone gets to you, the easier it is for you to see your own reflection and sometimes you're shocked by that. And... It's going to be that. And there's, you know, I mean, there are definitely some things to celebrate right now in my life. So, I mean, there's there's going to be a lot, probably a lot more hope yeah. on this album. But it's so far, it's about dealing with uh, trauma so that you can embrace love. Hmm. Man, that's awesome. Which I think everyone can yeah. relate to. Yeah. I don't think that it's not just like, oh my gosh, I went through this thing and I'm going to talk about it again. You know, there's yeah. a threshold to pain. Yeah. I really think you hit 10 and you're there. You yeah. know, I yeah. mean, yeah. you know, dude, I was in love with this girl. We were dating. I was a freshman in college and she left me. I hit 10. Yeah. I'm with you, man. Like you yeah. don't need to like, yeah. you don't need to yeah. lose an arm to relate. Yeah. Absolutely. And that that's that's the best sort of music though, is the kind that you know, like you can hear something and that's what I love the most about of music is the ability to take you to an exact moment. To yeah. it's e it's easy to sing about you know, things that are mindless, but if you can have a song that meets you at the bottom yeah. that helps pick you up off the floor. And for me personally, a lot of the songs on, um, you know, Peace of Wild Things did that, did that for me, you know, and, um, and man, I just want to encourage you, your willing, your willingness to be transparent. Um, there's a lot of people that have, that have been where you're at and it's not just saying, woe is me, but lending a voice to people who are broken thank you man um yeah. i just want you to know i appreciate that so much um jt it's it's been a pleasure i, I can't wait to hear i i send jt texts every once in a while and I, I tell him how much i love his so album how much i love paper out and then i always challenge him to write a three album you know a triple album opus i believe that paper out's capable of doing that i'm Here hoping that uh that this is gonna be it and i love that like i hope every song sounds like on this third album it sounds like you're the biggest band in the world thank you man. and that there's no rules no boundaries no um preconceived notions other than the song itself it's the goal here we go uh, so be on the lookout for that in addition to jt's piece the blackest bird from the short film blood and oil jt it's been a pleasure thank you Absolutely. so much for the time yeah. And we're going to get back to playing some racquetball, hit the sauna a few Let's times. Let's do it, man. Uh, and we'll touch base soon. Thanks, JT. Yeah, bro. Uh...